Good morning and thank you for joining us today at somewhat a different summer tent conference even since last year. This year we have what we're going to call as a blended approach to our conference with some of you joining us online and I can see them there. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me okay there at home? Yeah. Yeah. Thumbs up, excellent. And some of us joining us here in person, um, supported by our colleagues from the tenant and resident participation team. As you know, we're always uh, learning new ways of working with the ethos of around giving us to our tenants as many opportunities to participate as possible. So please, if you've got any feedback on how we can do that even better, please let us know. First of all, Apologies from Claire Mailer, our Deputy Director, who had hoped to attend today, but due to a committee diary clash, she's unable to be here, but she's asked me to wish you well for today's event. This is also the same for our elected members who tend to come along to our conferences, but like Claire, they also have a clash with the committee diary, um, but, and they're sorry for missing today's event. Some of you have already know me, and I'm Elaine Ritchie, I'm a Senior Service Manager within the Housing Service um, and on behalf of Claire and myself, I'd like to welcome our Housing Management team. I've got Martin Ritchie, who is the, um, oh sorry, that's my husband, <laughs> Martin <laughs> Smith, <laughs> it's got the same name, it's confusing, <laughs> Martin Smith, who is um, Service Manager for Specialist Services, which includes uh, housing allocations and um, homelessness. Uh, sheltered housing, temporary accommodation and also Perth city locality. And then on my right I've got Michelle Down, That's you right. probably all know Michelle and that name's right, <laughs> Michelle Down, um, who is the service manager for the locality teams, income max, tenant and resident participation and our safer communities team. And then we've got Nicola at the end. Nicola, I don't know if you were at our last tenant conference, probably not. not Nicola's new to our, not in person. Mm -hmm. Nicola is not that new to our team. Um, but Nicola is a service manager for our capital improvements and our new build programmes. And sadly, June is on holiday and she can't join us today. And June McCall, she's our service manager for housing repairs and maintenance. But last but not least, in the middle of, 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 of us women, alongside Martin, we've got Stephen Coyle, who's our finance team leader, and he keeps us right in terms of our budget spends and monitoring. There can be no doubt that COVID pandemic has changed many of our lives and will leave a lasting impact on many households and possibly some personal circumstances. It's never been more important than it is now for us to make sure our tenants' voices are heard and the rent setting and priority process is one of the most significant opportunities for you to do this. And this is the main reason for today's event. So before we get started, we've got a few housekeeping rules. So there is no planned fire alarm for today. So if the fire alarm does sound, could you leave at your nearest fire exit? And these are all pointed here. They're all illuminated in green. But we don't think there'll be a fire alarm. And if they do go off, use one of these exits and we'll meet you over at the jeweler shop. Please don't go into the jeweler shops. We'll meet you at the jeweler shop where we'll all do our register. There's toilets located on the ground floor. There's accessible toilets as well. Um, all on the ground floor, but ladies, I'm sorry, you're located on the first floor, so there's a couple of stairs, but there are accessible toilets on the ground floor if stairs are an issue. We've got a really busy agenda today, so we're hoping to have slight refreshments and suitable breaks throughout the agenda, and there's tea and coffees um, in the back area, so please help yourself. And you guys at home, just put the kettle on when you feel it's appropriate, but please come back and join us. We always will and will always continue to have a strong partnership approach when it comes to working with our tenants and providing opportunities to influence decision making. This has been challenging over the last 24 months, as you know, and our normal ways of working, we've had to adjust to provide and meet the co as a result of the COVID pandemic. We recognise the impact that this has had on our tenants in terms of your financial income, your health and wellbeing, and the impact of cost of living. So this is what we're focusing on these key areas at our conference today. Unfortunately, our new housing convener, Councillor Tom McEwen, who was just recently elected as our convener, is also unable to join us today due to a diary clash, but he has recorded a clip, a video clip for us to, with an introduction, Scott, that will give us a wee introduction of who he is and what his passion is in terms of housing. So Scott, can I ask you to play that clip? Thank you. First, I'd like to apologise for not being able to attend in person due to a pre-existing commitment. I am delighted to attend your summer conference as the newly appointed Convener of Housing and Social Wellbeing Committee. 
on behalf of myself and Councillors McCall and Welsh, the Vice Conveners, we can expect, extend our very warm welcome to you all to this your 2022 Summer Conference. I have been an elected member for the past five years and on the former Housing and Communities Committee. I am aware of the challenges and opportunities which face both us as a service and you as tenants during a time when household incomes are under great pressure. As you will have heard today's events is somewhat unique and that some of you will be in the Salutation Hotel alongside our housing management team and others will be participating online. We want to make sure as many of you as possible are appointed, are supported to participate in this event as your contribution is essential to us getting things right. Working in partnership with you, our tenants cannot be underestimated. It builds on the stronger ethos of true consultation and engagement, something which we are passionate about being a two-way process here in Perth and Ross. I hope you have all had the opportunity to view the pre-conference presentation, giving you an overview of some of the positive outcomes we have achieved over the past 12 months, together with how the rent setting process works in Perth and Ross. I know that we already have several questions which have been submitted, but as always, we welcome any further questions you have as we move through today's sessions. We appreciate that the last 24 months has been difficult for everyone and our commitment to you to make sure we continue to provide wraparound support and maintain affordable rent levels will continue indefinitely. Today's session allows us to identify what you as tenants have told us are your priorities and when it comes to spending your rent money. This will allow us to develop a range of options for further discussion at your autumn conference. I know you have a busy agenda today, including question and answer sessions with managers and a live panel session on the cost of living and climate change. I wish you all the best for today's event and I genuinely look forward to hearing the feedback from today and attending the autumn conference in person. Thank you. I just want to echo what the conveners are saying in appreciation of the role our tenants have played in supporting us through the pandemic in terms of your patience, particularly with our backlog and repairs, and just the, the, the different ways that we've had to work in order to cope and respond to the pandemic. So you'll see from the agenda we've got a live panel session later today focusing on the cost of living, which is quite topical and it's in the news and it's affecting us all. Climate change as well, and I'd like to thank our guest speakers, Gary Rennie from Energy Scotland. Is Gary here? No, not coming later. They're coming later, and Alistair Hood is from um, CAE. Finally, I'd like to thank all the services who have attended today to provide advice and assistance to the stalls, and hopefully you'll get the opportunity to go over and meet some of our colleagues. So I'd now like to hand over to Michelle, who's going to take you through the main presentation around the feedback we received from your tenants regarding our rent setting priorities and provide some background as to how we will work in partnership to determine these. Thanks Michelle. Okay, I'm here today to talk to you about rent setting and rent levels in Perth and Kinross. Some of you are seasoned pros and will have been at this event on a number of occasions. So just moving on to the next um, slide. Claire, uh, Elaine's outlined, we're getting good names today, aren't we? Um, Elaine's outlined the agenda for today. Uh, we are going to have a question and answer session at the end um, of my presentation. We will look at questions that we've already received from tenants. We'll then take questions from the floor and then when, we'll then switch to Kevin and online. So, but why are our rent setting survey results important? Well, they help us to understand what you think of our services. And it's an opportunity for you to tell us where you feel we can improve. It gathers your views on value for money and your priorities, which are the most important. And it helps to inform rent setting decisions for 2023-24. And the additional feedback helps us to deliver better services for you, our tenants. One of the most important tenant surveys is the rent setting survey followed by the rent level options which will be presented to you in the autumn. It sets the direction in terms of future rent level proposals. This year we return to issuing a paper survey with On the House together with online consultation through the hub. 
staff remind, staff were reminded to during any contact with tenants about the importance of taking part. Locality team staff were set targets for response rates, and I'm delighted to say we had 595 tenants reply, and that's an increase of 48.75% from the previous year. In addition, we received requests to contact nearly 110 tenants in relation to either repairs or concerns about their tenancy. We added 88 tenants to our interested parties list and 174 to our email updates list. This graph may be familiar to some of you. This is our strategic tenant engagement around rent setting. If you look at the bubble at the top in, in, in the middle, in, uh, April 2022 was when we started this process, when as I said, we issued you with the survey. In June, so that's where we are now, we're feeding back to you in the results of those surveys to make you aware of what we've been told by you is important. During July and August, we'll continue to offer opportunities for tenants to engage. As Elaine said, it's particularly important that we get as many of you involved as possible. From September onwards, we'll use this information to develop the rent level options. This will culminate in us coming back to you at, in October 2022 at the Autumn Conference to provide you with a range of rent level options. Then, as always, all tenants will be given the opportunity to vote on the rent level option they would prefer. So what did you tell us? Well, we asked you four questions and we asked you to say whether this was a high, medium, low priority for you as a tenant. The first area we asked you on, and probably one of the most important, was improving your repair service. And 65.75% of you told us that that should be a high priority for the council. And in fact, you know, a medium priority as well. When you add that up, that's almost 90% of tenants uh, saying to us who replied that that was important. We also asked you about improving the quality of your home and in relation to the sponsors there you can see that uh, just under 69% of you told us that that was important for you and with 20% uh, saying a medium priority so again nearly 90%. Improving your neighbourhood as a place to live in, 40, nearly 46% of you told us that that was a priority and again, looking further down, you know, nearly 34% of you telling us that that should be a medium priority for us as a service. <coughs> Finally, we asked you um, about information for tenants and opportunities for tenants to participate. Of those who responded, 25.38% of you told us that this was a priority for you, with 41% saying it was a medium priority. So we then asked you, okay, so under each of these headings, what would be the most important priority for you? So under improving our repair service, the top priority for you is completing the repair on the first visit wherever possible. Improve the quality of the repair and the materials used the second. And third was reduce the time it takes to start and complete a repair. And finally, make it easier to report a repair, which is your fourth priority. In terms of improving the quality of your home and probably particularly relevant given um, the climate change and the cost of living, making your home more energy efficient was your top priority. Followed by improving the way we deal with darkness and condensation, improving the inside of your home, for example kitchens, bathrooms, internal doors and skirtings. Fourth was improving soundproofing and insulation in your home. And fifth was improving the exterior of your home, so painting, roof, gutter clearing, etc. In terms of improving your neighbourhood as a place to live, you told us that top, your top priority was additional resources to respond quickly to and tackle antisocial behaviour where it arises. Second was improving the landscape and maintenance of the neighbourhood, such as fences and boundary walls. And third was to increase the opportunities for community safety improvements in relation to, for example, lighting and entranceways. And finally, improving communal areas internally and externally uh, in terms of close painting, bin storage or drying areas. And finally, in terms of information for tenants and participation, your top priority was providing more support to tenants to help them keep their home. Second was improving communication across the service. This is something which regularly comes up at these meetings. 
Third was increasing the availability of the advice and assistance in relation to increases in the cost of living and accessing practical and financial support. And finally, an increase in the awareness of and the opportunities for you to participate and have your say. So what happens next? So we'll use this information to start to develop red level option proposals for 2023-24. We'll we will ensure that there is a balance between what is deliverable, the cost of delivery, and importantly, rent affordability. These options will be presented at our autumn conference and all tenants will be given a rent level voting survey to complete and the outcome of this will be included in our report to Housing and Social Wellbeing Committee in January. So I think now we're going to go to the question and answer session. We've got some that you might want to ask us. Sorry. We've got three sets of questions. One that you've sent in already and there's some answers to come on those. Some that you might have thought of and you want to have some floor. And we've also got our online community courtesy of Kev at the back and I know they've been sending in questions. So may I go to the ones that we've had in already to start with? So the first question is from Mrs. Brenner, who is probably online at the moment. She asked, uh, you Michelle, um, what are the outcomes of the HRI transfers from Rope Makers Close, Ducock Court and 37D High Street? Hi, thanks for the question, uh, Trisha. Um, all those uh, HRA asset transfers were approved and are now being used for either community facilities or supported accommodation. What we are going to look at as well is also making sure that we close the loop in terms of uh, notifying tenants and the outcomes of the consultation. Thank you for that, Michelle. Uh, Gia also asked about common grass cutting uh, when she's got an account with the council. That affects some of you, so that's why we've included this question. Who do we contact if the communal grass cutting isn't done? You would contact your local housing team um, if it's communal. If it's an area of concern around the garden maintenance scheme, then you would contact colleagues in communities um, and you would contact the green space uh, consultant there, but I, I can get that information on to you, Trisha. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question from Gerald, who's in the room. Thank you, Gerald. Um, you know, Gerald asked us a couple of questions, but there are other things that we're going to sort out for you, Gerald. But this one in particular, you wanted to know about the lift at your flats. Um, you said that they, they needed spare parts, but because the lift maintenance company isn't the manufacturer of the lift system, um, they aren't able to repair it straight away. Would it be best to order spare parts in advance? You asked that question, Gerald. And this is Nicola Lennon. Hi. Um, yeah, Gerald, thanks for your question. Um, we do have an issue at the moment across um, all of the, the lifts that we've got that the spare parts aren't readily available and it's really to do with the, the way the market is at the moment. But you are right in saying that the, the lift is a tissing crop um, lift and our maintenance contractor is Coney. So Coney are working um, hard to try and get spare parts for the lifts when they do break down but Tiss and Krupp themselves don't actually have the spare parts either and they've quoted a six week mm -hmm. lead in time for those. So Coney have worked hard to try and um, source an alternative manufacturer for the parts. So the part that we're waiting on at the moment for the lift, um, they've managed to source that from a, a different supplier and it should be with us within the next day or two. We were hoping it would be here today. If it's here today, it'll be fitted tomorrow. If it's um, here tomorrow, it'll be fitted on Friday. The, the actual repair itself is only going to take 20 minutes, but it is down to the availability of the spare parts and the manufacturers themselves don't actually have that part themselves at all. So we've got that. Yeah. Hi, Thank you. Um, what corners got the uh, contract to do the delivery? Why wasn't the ask, or why weren't the ask for the booth? Have you got spare parts? How easy is it to get spare parts? Because every time you need a spare part, they've got to send to Germany or somewhere. And uh, this is four weeks now that, you know, it's ridiculous that a company can't carry some spare parts. And would you look at Cornish's contract to see if there's anything in the contract which uh, says you have to carry spare parts? The, the, there isn't anything in the contract that says because they're not re readily available. I mean, what the, 
there is a there is a part in the contract that says there is a time scale in which they, they need to repair the lift, um, but only if the, the parts are available. But the manufacturer themselves doesn't have the parts, so it's not that Coney aren't trying to get the parts, um, the manufacturer themselves doesn't have them. Um, and we, there is a shortage across the construction industry of, of a lot of different spare parts and it's down to a variety of reasons, but we, we do have problems. It's not cost effective for Coney as well to, to carry a, a large stock of parts. Um, the contract that we have with them is three years um, and we have the ability to, to extend that by one year, but um, for them to, to hold spare parts, they, they then may make a loss because they might not get the contract the next time it's tendered. So they're then left with spare parts. Okay. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, another question from uh, a lady that sent in an email to say, uh, we used to have a free rent month at Christmas and Easter. Why don't the council do this again? It would help with the cost of living rises. Uh, yeah, to answer that question, um, it wasn't so much a rent holiday. Um, yes, we did have um, two free weeks in summer and two free weeks at Christmas, but they weren't free. All that happened was your annual rent was charged over 48 weeks, so we paid more. Whereas we switched to uh, paying over 52 weeks about five, six years ago. Um, but that's not to say uh, that you can choose. You can choose to pay extra over the 48 weeks and still take, you know, um, a, a month where you know you're in credit with your rent. So you know you can still do that. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, could you kindly provide that answer to me? I was able to phone the lady back and explain. So thank, thank you. you. Um, we've had a couple of questions too from. Um, the chat already, Kevin. Uh, so we'll go to the floor first and then I'll bring the microphone over to you and you can read them out. Yep. So anybody got any questions from the floor? Terry. Oh, Do I come you. over to you, Terry? Thank you very much, thank you. Here we go, you have the microphone, yeah? Uh, good morning. My, my name is Morgan Moore, Mark at Court Perth. Uh, I'm very interested in what the lady said here about ordering, ordering. Audrey, and I would like you to categorise what has happened at Mill and Market Court. On Friday coming will be four weeks, four weeks that lift has been out of order. There has not been one note of paper put on our notice board to apologise or get an update. I got a phone call yesterday with an update and the lady here gave me exactly what you said there. Yeah. I don't know how you're going to privatise this so that um, repair. What, what category does it come under? Is it serious, not so serious, or we'll get by? You know, the repair shell. I would like to ask the floor, what category would you put a lift out of order in four weeks? In, in terms of the lifts, it's an essential part of, of being in the, the block. Um, however, as we've identified, that there are no parts to be had. So, I, I mean, we, we are looking at the updates part of it. Um, it's something that we spoke about. The caretakers have been given an update, but I appreciate that that then means that maybe not all the owners are being updated. It might be only the tenants. So it is something that we have looked at that we will put an update now on the notice board. We had not anticipated that the repair would take as long as it would. Um, Tyson Krupp, the, the manufacturer, had given us a six week notice period saying that that was how long it was going to take for them to provide us with the part. Um, and that was when Coney started the work to try and find out if they could source an alternative part from somewhere else. I do appreciate that the updates are, are not great and that's what, something that we will work on. But I, the, the lift is an essential part of staying in the block and I appreciate it is causing issues for quite a lot of people. However, you, we, we have only had one person ask, ask about it and we've not had any other complaints with regards to that, but I'm not saying that that's acceptable. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Malcolm. We did have a question from Vivian Mann. Kevin, we took the question, she's online at the moment, Vivian Mann, 
She was asking about uh, the cards that you have to pay rent and council tax. And she said, used the words, they don't flip through, so how do we get new cards to pay your uh, rent and council tax? When she said the words that flip through, we didn't under quite understand what she meant. Could you, could you ask her in the chat, and we can clarify that question, because we'd like to help Vivian with her query. I know you've got a very operatic voice in this, but you need to speak to this. But don't sing. I think perhaps what Vivian means is that when you go um, in, into a shop or anywhere to pay your rent, not to be able to scan your card. My card is never worked. So that, I think, is what she means by the person to do. They don't scan the card. We did wonder when we talked about this, Michelle, this question whether it meant updating the cards. Is that something, Stephen? Is that what you are remit? We, so. we can have a look into that. I mean, it's the sort of thing we need to find out about. We don't normally find out, do we? We would need to go back to um, our card providers um, and check whether or not there was that facility. But it's certainly something we can put on to have a look into, Vivian. So thank you for that suggestion. As a roving reporter, I'm now going to the back of the room to our online community. Is everybody else okay? Any thoughts at the moment? No, you're all right. Don't have to strain. You don't have to turn around. What I'm going to do is ask Kevin to read them, read them out. So don't don't break your necks. Don't worry. Yeah. So this is weird here now, two years ago. Um, the only question that one person has is that there's a five-year council plan that will cover a general election. Is there an alternative scenario in terms of the possibility of a government being elected who are prepared to increase spending on public service as opposed to cutting them? I'm heading back now to Stephen, I think. Is he on? I'm heading to Stephen. Good man. Well, we need to get another mic uh, microphone. Do, yeah. uh, the impact of the general election won't impact on what we do within the House and Revenue Account. House and Revenue Account is a completely ring fence account uh, through tenants' money, um, etc. So it's not impacted directly from any cuts from either uh, local government, uh, the Scottish government, or the, the UK government. So. Impacts may be dependent on what priorities they uh, have and, and going forward, but certainly any cuts, etc., won't impact on the House of Revenue account. Thank you, Stephen. Could you check with Dave? Is that the answer he was after? I'm coming back to you. I'll just show you. I get the exercise for the day. The only other point someone put so far is uh, surely isolation, uh, sorry, insulation and soundproofing falls under the same area as energy efficiency. Yet there were separate questions, stroke priorities in the question here. You very kindly supported our climate challenge people, so I think that might be one from one of them. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, I've actually put the same note down here to pick that up after the after the uh, conference. Um, I, I would agree that the insulation element um, is something that we should set under energy efficiency. I'm not so sure about the sound insulation part because th th that's about separation between properties, but certainly the insulation element would um, fall under energy efficiency. So we can maybe. Um, when some of the next surveys come out, we can maybe uh, target that area uh, separately or, or break down the energy efficiency to, to understand what people think um, is more important from one element to the, to the other. But yeah, I, I would agree that the, the insulation part should be taken away from sound insulation and put into energy efficiency. Thank you, Nicola. Nothing more coming through, Ken? Bailey's just come back with an extra saying just want to know if you were okay with the opportunity of more money available for public services and how would you spend this if it was available? Uh, 
I think again, if we're talking about public services and non-council tenants, that will be dealt with within the general fund budget setting process and is out with this uh, sort of arena here. If we're talking about how we would spend more money in terms of the house and revenue count, that's the, what we're gathering the information from the surveys, real feedback, and then we'll have a lot in confidence. So we need to make sure we keep the two things separate. I obviously can't answer what, I have an idea of what we'd like to spend public services money on, but that's, I can't answer that for you. That's a different arena, and, and it might be worth speaking to your, your local councillor if you've got any ideas uh, uh, for them to feed into the budget setting process. Thank you, Stephen. Any more thoughts from the floor? Having heard the other questions? Lynn, I'm going to you. I've had an email in the end of June. Oh, but obviously you haven't had it. Do you want to repeat your question here? Are you OK? Or do you <coughs> have any, had a chance to think about it? OK, we'll, we'll talk about it in the break and we can get them to have a look at it in the break. So we can break do, do you think you can find out whether the email wasn't received? I'll check it. Mm. I've got my phone over there, so I'll check it. Do we have any more people here? Everyone happy? Judy, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Just a simple question, actually. Have you, have you any idea, or anybody can tell me when Blue House will be open to the front counter? The <laughs> I know it's open with the, the employees, but it's, it's rather. Sorry, Dave, that you're on the phone and sometimes you don't understand. It's open, it is open, but it's only open for appointments. So if you're wanting to come in, you have to book an appointment to come in. And that's just part of our measures in terms of keeping our staff safe and seeing with other offices. But it is something that we're currently looking at. And it's not just the housing service that operates outside Pooler House. There's quite a lot of services in there. But if you're wanting to come in, because I understand what you're just saying there, you can go in and book an appointment and come and meet with the member of staff. We are getting a uh, fresh coffee and tea at 12 and pastries. I know we're getting sandwiches at 1 o'clock, so do stay for those. Our speakers are not arriving until about 12 ish. So, if, do you want to take a break now? No yeah, break? 20 minutes. So, and then we can find out what. Hang on a minute, I think we've got a last minute incoming from the back room. So, uh, someone said also on anti social behaviour, etc. Surely it's important for outside properties to look nice or else people stop caring. So they kind of go together as well as on the questionnaire. Keep everyone nice and giving people pride. Yeah. So there's something to add to the questionnaire so we can isolate that particular subject in the future for priorities. Is that yeah. right? So good. Anything to add other than anti-social peoples? I don't mean you're anti-social. I mean, you're not. You're very smiling. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Uh, Nicholas just advised me that's tenancy manager management and not antisocial behaviour, so we will make sure that gets back to the right department to talk about. Terry? Terry. What's like going to tell you? I don't know if this is to do with you people or not, but the last two or three months I've been trying to get in touch with the chief executive for a meeting. The PA has left the phone and put the phone down. So if any is known, would you get a message to her very quickly that I'll put on the front of the PA? And I know her name, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. If I don't get a meeting with the chief executive as soon as possible. It's a disgrace actually, a disgrace. I feel sorry for all people that are trying to get in touch and they can't, but I'm very mobile. I'm right on it. Front of the PA if you don't get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. It sounds like we need to have a chat in the break as well. We'll catch up with you. Thank you for that. Is that everybody? You're all looking at me. I think that's okay. Lots of time to have a chat. We're finishing slightly earlier than we thought for this particular session. And there will be a refreshment of the teas and coffees and 
Phase two is at 12. So we'll catch up with you in a second. So should we just uh, that that's the first part of the session over? Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Now we have um, two speakers here. They're very kind to come along to give us their time on the subject, overarching subject of cost of living. And we're going to first of all introduce Gary Rennie. He's the chap there, waving at you. <laughs> and he'll tell you where he's from, but it's staff and the energy wise people, but you're I'm no doubt you've got a long title, which I can't remember now, so you'll be able to tell. Energy advisor. Right? Energy advisor, there we go. Nice and simple, policy. exactly, yeah. <laughs> And energy advice in an upbeat way. And next to him is Alistair Hood, who's financial advisor from CAN. Yep. We do love CAN. So thank you for coming along, no, both no, of you. Not problem. So, Gary, you're up first. You drew the short straw. You didn't know that, but it was drawn for you. Yes, we have the way first. So, okay. I'm going to give you the microphone. Cool. And after they've both spoken, um, we'll have a QA session for both of them in a similar way. But we've now got a second microphone at the back, so Kevin's armed for the online people. Hello, online people. There we go. Gary, go. introduce yourself. Okay. Yeah, hi everyone. So, my name is Gary Rennie. Uh, I'm an energy advisor for SCARF. We're a registered charity that have offices between Dundee and Aberdeen, and we work throughout the northeast of Scotland. So, I've just wrote down some wee bullet points just to give you an idea of some of the services of SCARF that we offer, and um, I will attempt to answer any questions that some people may throw at me. Um, so one of the first things that we try to do is eradicate fuel poverty and um, people that are using more than 10% of their household annual incomes on their fuel um, are classed as being fuel poor. Now since the crisis or the energy crisis has happened we have found a lot more people nowadays are actually fuel poor based on more than 10% of their income going towards their energy bills. So what we try and do is we try and get tailored advice in their household based on, on their energy usage, on their heating systems. And we try and assess people for grants that can be funded through the Scottish Government. So we work alongside Home Energy Scotland. Home Energy Scotland can assess customers to see if they qualify for new heating systems, insulation for loft, wall insulation, new doors, sometimes windows in certain circumstances. If they receive certain benefits or in the right position in their homes, they can get up to £5,000 of work done for free potentially through this scheme. Um, so that's one of the first things we look at. This scheme bit tends to be for private tenants and homeowners because as you all know with the council and housing associations they have their own funding access to do work in their own properties. One of the other things that we try and support people with is if people have certain situations where they're very low credit for electric or gas, we offer something called redress vouchers based on certain circumstances. So what this can be is as a £49 voucher which they don't have to pay back which can give them a bit of a help in hand to last them hopefully a week or two towards their energy bills. They can get up to a certain amount of them based on certain circumstances and just phone us in, we would go out to them, speak to them, make sure that their positions in a, the position to say they are, look at their meter, make sure that they're not over indulging credit. If they are in a situation with an emergency credit we can basically get them a top up there on the day to support the client. So I, I'm based in Dundee myself, and in Dundee we have access to what's called free soft measures. Now soft measures are funded through the scheme that I work on, so we've got giveaway uh, light bulbs which include screw-ins and bayonet bulbs. We've also got draft excluders for the bottom front and back doors. We've got letterbox draft excluders for people that have older doors that are losing heat through the letterbox. We also give away things called uh, radiator reflector panels, so there are panels that go behind the back of the radiators and when you turn your heating on, rather than the heat rising going out of the room, it helps curb the heat in, which makes the heat last a bit longer. And we also give away draft proofing tapes for gaps in windows if they're losing heat from the window frames, these help to keep heat a bit longer in the windows. And for people that don't have insulation on their hot water tanks, we do have hot water tank jackets to give away as well. So anyone in Dundee that meets the criteria, they can just get in touch with us and we can offer these things for them. There's no cost for it. Depending on what their household's entitled to, we will give everything that they're entitled to. Just all free money from them, basically, to support them. Um, we have another scheme. So for people that potentially have hundreds or potentially thousands of pounds of fuel debt, there is a scheme that's open which is called the Home Heat Support Fund. What this basically is, is a scheme that can help to in some cases clear off people's whole amounts of fuel poverty and um, we've had it in instances where people have been in certain situations where they've had over a thousand pounds of debt on their energy bills and this scheme's managed to wipe off the, the debt completely for people so it's been a fantastic outcome where before if you'd make a referral you were again through then a week or two to get a response but now that it's so well known that it's taken off three months to get a response now as you can imagine when 
people know that there's potential money to, for free to get rid of their, their debt, it, it goes pretty quickly, so it's quite a long basis now, but we still try and support everyone with this scheme if we can. And what we also do is sometimes we do get referrals from other organisations that try to get people support with their, their debt in other access areas. And um, if we can't help them with not a non-energy related matter, we'll put them towards the likes of an organisation called Brooks Bank who are based in Dundee. They offer a really good hand holding service to support people who might have debt homes outside of the energy crisis area. So if we don't know the answer or can't give advice on someone that's not in our sector, we will point people towards other organisations we have partnerships with as well. So that's pretty much a bit of a nutshell about some of the services we offer. Um, if anyone's got any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Thank you again for your time. I could end the Martin Lewis Money Show from time to time, and two to three months ago, there was very conflicting evidence, a very conflicting uh, advice for the news about whether to fix one's electric bill or to go for severe or things. Mm -hmm. I eventually fixed my electric bill to quite safe for about another year and a half. Mm -hmm. But what is the recommendation to anyone on your side that um, do they try and fix it and have a look? Or do they go and remain on the river? I agree that there it will have to be worked out. And I sat and worked mine out actually over a six month period mm -hmm. and looked at my payments. Mm -hmm. and I'm actually about £17 in credit at the moment, which mm -hmm. I'm quite happy with. Mm -hmm. But it still seems to be conflicted. And even Martin Lewis doesn't seem to be able to say, yes, this is what one should do. Yeah. So, what would you do to anybody? who asked, will I fix it? Because there's another increase coming up in uh, October. Or do I actually just sit and <laughs> so hope for the best? When I'm so when I'm asked that question from clients, it, it, there's no right or wrong answer. But at the moment, I'm classing a fixed tariff as a gamble. Um, I'll speak to the microphone. I, know, I think we can hear you, but That's okay. why not? Um, yeah, I do class it as a bit of a gamble. Um, they're saying that the new price cap in October is going to be around £2,800 for the average household bills based on their usage. It, I'm describing it as a gamble. Um, at the moment, you are getting tariffs with British Gas who are offering between 11 and 11 and a half pence per kilowatt for gas and somewhere along the lines of 37 to 38 pence for electric. That's quite a bit more than the current price cap we're on at the moment. But the gambles to say for the next five months, you might be paying more for the next five months, but in October, you may have protected yourself from the new price cap, which could be 14 pence for gas and 40 pence for electric. So there, there is no right or wrong answer. We try to give people all the advice we can, and then we have to tell the person to make the decision themselves. We, we can't tell the person what to do, but it, it is a gamble. So to be truthfully honest with you, I'll give you all, like what I've mentioned is how I would explain it, but that there's no right or wrong answer. Price cap might be right. You might find that they might jump, not jump to what they're estimating it to be, but then there is the other side of the coin where it does go up to that, and then the tariff that you could have got now would have been cheaper than what the new price cap is. So it is, in my opinion, a gamble, whatever you do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Thank you. Gary, so has anyone else got a question from the floor for Gary before I find out what the online community are asking? No? <laughs> what have you got, Gary? Okay, just a couple of points. <laughs> um, is it possibly better to rail against the privatised energy companies as opposed to helping people pay the charges they impose? Real against them. I think it means lobby to lobby for cheaper energy prices. I can't really comment on that to be honest. I mean, it's not really something that we would get involved to answer with that. I mean, if people want to make that decision for themselves, that is something that we could do, but we, we probably would not advise doing something like that because if you do that, it could just cause a bit of chaos to be honest. Where potentially in the future, yeah, if everyone did start railing and cancelled their direct debits and whatnot. It might eventually, when people aren't paying money to suppliers, they might have to act on it, but obviously it's not recommended because all you'll start doing is putting yourself in more debt and you might start getting debt collection agencies later in the end telling you that they're going to come to your door and start requesting money that you own them. So it's not something that probably is a sensible idea, although ironically it might help in the future, but it's not recommended. And he's come back to say he means to campaign for a renationalised service. I 
I'll, I'll stay silent on that one. <laughs> I'll stay silent on that one. And the other one is, is there a similar redress scheme, sorry, a common measure scheme for Delvin Canal? Not at the moment, unfortunately. Um, at the moment, this is only funding that was given through Dundee Council and off Gem on the contract I'm on. We're hoping that in the future that Perth might get more access to this, but this isn't something at the moment. But if it's really, if, if we find that somebody's in really, really dire straits, then we could probably try and do something to support them to do that. But at the moment, I would answer no to that, unfortunately. Sorry, any comments from Edward? Yeah, I you know, the problem is we just keep on being told how it's to be and then we just do what they want. You know, nobody ever rises up, nobody in Britain rises up like maybe in other countries. But it's, you know, like how, how much longer are we going to carry on like that for and, and not be, not become activists? I can't really say anything to that, to be honest. We all wonder the same question, but we, we just hope at some okay. point, obviously, you know, the, the government are trying to act where everyone's going to be getting a £400 payment at least in October time to start supporting your electric bills, but th th that's how long is a piece of string, you know. We like to hope that it's going to be acted on, but as you can imagine, it's just a waiting game for us until that's implemented as well. So who knows, unfortunately, but we, we are with you in the same boat. I mean, we use energy ourselves in our own homes as well, so we understand the cost of living ourselves as well, you know, you've just got to do what we can until we hear more support when it comes. I think, Ming you just keep telling us how you how things are for all of you, because we can, we can support, or we hear from Alistair as well, we hear some more about more support, but don't shy away from coming to us for help or going to our welfare rights team or people that have got the information yeah. to support you. It starts with raising your voice. People must get into the way of raising their voice. It is a big issue for a lot of people, they're quite right. Have you got anything more for us at the moment, Kev? Not at the moment. Thank you, Gary. I All know right. you've left a lot of material at the back, and I'm sure you're yeah, going to join us for sandwiches, so we've been yeah, to totally questions. Fine. We've got loads load of leaflets, so if any of your organisations that you want to take a huge handful for, there's Thermometers, uh, thermometer stats there to get your temperature in the living room, Ener top 10 energy advice tips, take as many as you want to help food organisations pass out to yourselves, friends, family, uh, clients that you work with, yeah, they're all there to hand Thank out. Thank you. Okay. I've got one of those tomorrow. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I know how cold I am. Yeah. Um, Ken, you put your hand up, you've got another, yeah. you've got your microphone there. Yeah, but I've got uh, Diane has wondered, is there any chance PKC could put finance into a soft measure scheme similar to what they do in Dundee? I wouldn't be able to give you the answer to that, but I can write it down and I can speak to higher management back in Dundee and see if there is an option for that. And I could, if I get some email addresses today, I can maybe relay that back on what they come out with. I know our management team are all looking at each other to work out what, where that message would go, so we'll work something out. Oh, just, yeah. Nicola, this is Nicola Lennon. Should be able to Hi, yeah. That. yeah, of course. Sorry. It's, um, just to say that as part of the climate change agenda in Perth and Kingdoms Council, um, we are looking at trying to bring all of these um, teams together into one type of advice service. So um, there's a climate change board meeting this afternoon that there's papers going up to, um, to consider. Um, opportunities that SCARF and CAB and the, the HEAT team in Blair Gowdy, um, and there's a, a team now in um, Arabeldi as well, so that we're giving out a consistent message in terms of climate change and energy efficiency, um, and one of those is to look at potential for soft measures, but again it will come down to budget, so that will be part of the discussion at the Climate Change Board this afternoon. Is that, could you hear that all right, Ted? Yeah. 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 Carry on. There was a bit of a chat about how America and mainland Europe are all cheaper and I'm suggesting we all need to be a bit more French. But also... I think that goes with what Lynn was saying and what Gerald was saying. Yeah. Ban the barricades, yeah? But well, someone's asking, if, can energy companies cut people off if they don't pay their bills? 
After a good while, they can, yeah. I mean, it's not one of these things where you don't pay a couple of bills and they cut you off. You would get probably numerous letters to say, if this doesn't get paid eventually, it will go to a debt collection. If that doesn't happen, then it would go down the route of notifying you that you will be cut off by this point if you don't start paying anything. But we would re really never want to hear anyone be in that situation. So if you've ever known anyone that's ever in a position where you know they've not looked at their bills for so long because they're so scared to look at it, or if they're getting uh, letters threatening them to say they're going to get called, please tell them get in touch with ourselves at SCARF or like a financial sector like CAB or someone, and we will look at options to try and contact their supplier and stop that from happening and look at funding options 100%. Don't know the answer to that. I, I can answer that yeah. one. Yeah, if um, there are certain things, it's called a priority services register. So if there's certain types of disability in the house, where if people have certain um, medications that need refrigerated, if they have use of oxygen, if they have children, things like that, but you have to apply for the priority services register with your supplier to be registered to exempt you from that. But they can also then enforce. Um, Prepayment meters, so then self disconnection can become an issue with that as well, which the legislation doesn't unfortunately cover um, as well. Thank you. Must be done, you, Mr. Sorry. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Alistair. Uh, just call me Al. I am the team leader of the debt team at um, Perth Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, I'm here not just in that capacity, but to speak more widely about the Bureau itself. But um, Obviously, um, the current um, crisis of, of you know, the cost of living at the moment is something that's impacting us and our clients immensely at the moment. Um, but in Perth, we serve the citizens of Perth and Kinross. Most of our funding comes through Perth and Kinross Council as well. So you know, we work very closely with the housing teams, the welfare rights team, um, and all sorts of other community teams and things um, within, and also with the NHS uh, in Perth and Kinross as well. Um, we have um, obviously um, the debt team, so we have caseworkers that can help people with complex and emergency debt issues. Part of that, we also help people with um, maximising their income, whether it's doing benefit checks and helping people claim benefits that they maybe not know they're entitled to. But for working people as well, we look at um, tax codes to make sure they're not being overtaxed and make sure there's not deductions being made from their wages that shouldn't or they don't know about. Things like pension contributions and things like that as well. We also help people with the day-to-day -day budgeting, so encouraging them to things like swap their electricity, although that's a bit more of um, a moot point at this moment, but also if they have um, insurances, and um, the big one is telephone and internet connections as well. There's usually a lot of um, savings that can be made there if you move around when your contract ends and things like that. So that's part of what the debt team does. We also have a, a complex benefits team that will help people with applications for benefits, especially there's lots of changes in legislation at the moment where some benefits are moving from being Westminster led to led at Holyrood and the, the new Scottish Social Services. Um, so a lot of people don't have the experience of these new applications for the new benefits as well. Um, for example, at the moment in Perth and Kinross, we are able for clients to apply for the new adult disability payment through Social Security Scotland. That is not rolled out throughout all of Scotland at the moment. And that is a um, change from the personal independence payment, which is another disability payment that comes from Westminster. Um, it's still early days to see which one is actually more beneficial for clients. It's always, when there's a change like that at the moment, it's always a wee bit... Um, we're not of a concern, but we're still, you know, we, we don't know which way is better at the moment. Um, at the moment, but the, the application process is still getting used to and things. Um, we also have a part-time energy advisor who can help with similar things um, that Scarf do. But we also work in conjunction with Scarf and Home Energy Scotland and Heat and Blair Gowrie as well, um, because obviously with one part-time energy advisor, that's not a lot of capacity to help everybody. Um, 
We also can do things, I mean, we are a holistic service, so we deal with employment queries, which obviously over the past two years with COVID, there was an awful lot of, of employment issues. Um, we also can deal with immigration and relationship breakdowns, anything like that on a general basis. Um, so, but in specific to the cost of living, the debt team and the benefit teams are really taking the biggest lead in, in that, um, in helping people to either reduce their costs or increase their income, which is really the, the way forward. And just, I thought, I thought it might be interesting, I, I took a few wee stats and I'm not going to bore you with lots and lots of statistics because I don't think that's really what, what you want to know, but just to, to, to she, although we're in the early days of this cost of living crisis and the news this morning is just saying inflation's gone up to 9.2%, um, which is quite scary, um, the Bureau between May 2021 and May this year we had a 30% increase in clients coming f to us for advice. And within that, we had a 40% increase in clients with debt issues. And because we had this new capacity, a 262% increase in people with utility cost issues. And that is just basically problems with their, um, their electricity and gas accounts and, and debt surrounding that as well. Um, but it's not all bad news as well, because in that same period, we had a 52% increase in um, the financial gains we made for clients. And for clients in Perth and Ross this year, we've made financial gains directly through our interactions with them of £2.5 million in the first five, year, five months of this year. Those figures are up to the end of May. <clears throat> so, I mean, I would always encourage people that as, as a debt advisor for, for almost 10 years and, and the lead of the debt team, I would always, always encourage people to talk about things. I think from my experience in dealing with people, there is a lot of anxiety about um, money and debt problems. Um, a lot of people having to choose between paying different essential costs. You know, we all, none of us should have to worry about putting food on the table or paying our electricity bill, but that does happen a lot more and I'm getting those sorts of conversations with people, which is very, very difficult. But talking to, to people like ourselves, talking to friends and family, because there is a little bit that I always try and encourage people that, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved sometimes, and even if it is a little bit of reduction in the stress and anxiety that people are feeling about these things, um, I think talking can help. Plus, you know, they might know something that you don't and, and help with, with some of the things that we've talked about as well. Um, I think that uh, it's quite important that. Um, I also get a lot of guilt from people that have um, debt problems and especially parents that feel that they can't provide things for their children um, that they feel they should do as well. Um, but there are lots of other I mean, we said about the um, the home heating fund. We can help people apply for grants depending on their employment history, and sometimes we will get things for, you know, washing machines if it's broken and, and people can't afford to pay it, or um, quite often related to employment history for like there, for example, is the retail trust, um, the Scottish Licensed Trade Benevolence Society, to name a couple where they will sometimes give people lump sums to pay for debts, or indeed will sometimes award small um, stipends over a six or 12 month period to help with essential costs where people are particularly pinched, especially during periods of maybe unemployment when they're still job seeking as well. Um, so there are lots and lots of different things out there. And for individuals to try and navigate that, it can be quite bewildering. And that's where, you know, we're the experts. We know where these things are and we can point people in the right direction. So basically, any queries, just come contact the Bureau. And, um, you know, we're in Athol Crescent, just at the North Inch, but you'll find this sort of phone number and we've got web chat and, and everything like that these days as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think that's me for just now, if anyone's got any questions or anything like that. I could literally, I love the Bureau, I'm very passionate about it, so I could talk for hours, so I, I, my boss always says, shut up when the time's right, so hopefully that's the right time. <laughs>
certain discussion points and stuff going on the line. A few compliments as well. So, Cab do a great job. I have a lot of admiration for them fighting against a system or helping people cope with it. Then someone's going to say, there has to be a change in debt management. There's too many people are in too much debt. And, it, and to say that over a certain level, they have to declare bankruptcy, which impacts severely on everyday life and future life. It's really got, a, it's got kind of out of date. If you go back 20 years or even 10 years, and the limits for declaring bankruptcy were more accurate. Now they are a laugh, and I do not mean that in a good way. By the way, I also think CAB provides a fantastic service. Bankruptcy is an odd one because we do do a lot of bankruptcies at the Bureau. Um, we have a debt team of five specialist advisors that are all authorised to do bankruptcies. And, you know, the commenter is absolutely correct. It is not something to be undertaken lightly. Um, it is something that will have quite a deep long-term impact on people's credit worthiness and, and, and can affect jobs and things like that in certain circumstances in the future as well. Um, the only thing I would say is that as part of the advice that uh, my team give is anybody would be talked through that in great detail so they were aware of all of the cons as well as the pros <coughs> before making that decision. And it's not something that we would ever undertake lightly. and. Um, our whole ethos at the Bureau is to give people advice to make informed decisions for themselves and then help them with what those decisions are. So we would never tell people, you should do this, you should do that, other than this is a variety of things that you can consider and we'll help you with what you think is best for you. Um, but I, I mean, legislation's legislation. We. Whilst we are politically neutral as an organisation, our parent body, Citizens Advice Scotland, does lobby both um, at Westminster and at Holyrood for changes in legislation that we think are appropriate um, whilst being politically independent as well. So whilst the, the Bureau in Perth is not actively involved in that, Citizens Advice Scotland, that is our parent body, is, is very active in lobbying. Someone else has asked whether we can prevent credit card companies trying to throw money at young people and then hounding them for the rest of their lives to get back a loan plus its sovereign interest. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's, that is definitely something that needs looked at. Um, and, and I think what, what is being alluded to there is if someone takes out a credit card for £500 or £1,000, just because you pay it okay for a while, suddenly your limit is three or £4,000, but there is no re-evaluation of people's ability to pay that higher credit limit. Um, but again, that is something that my team will argue, and we do, you know, it isn't just bankruptcies, it isn't just repayment plans, we will argue over the terms of contracts with people. Also, if people are suffering from particularly mental ill health, we will argue if they have the capacity to contract, and we're quite successful in having debts written off for that basis. Um, but also, where people have long-term physical um, health problems as well that limits their ability to work and their ability to um, increase their income. We will also argue quite and do quite successfully with credit card companies and other creditors to either have debts completely written off or to just stop being chased for them and allow the passage of time to, to write off the debts. Um, so they are things that we do quite regularly. It's not appropriate for everyone. It's a service that we have to take everyone as an individual and, and what it is. But if that is inappropriate for one of our clients, we absolutely do those things. Um, someone is also saying if people have to go to the CAB to claim benefits they're entitled to, then that's uh, something bad about our existing benefit system uh, that people uh, are entitled to stuff and should have tried. And they also think that we all need universal basic income to take away the stigma and let people live a life rather than just exist. To answer the first question, yes, the benefit system is far too complicated and it is all too easy for people to miss things they're entitled to. I 100% agree with that. Um, again, that is something that Citizens Advice Scotland try to lobby against and we are 
hopeful the new Scottish social security system will be slightly easier, um, but it is also like trying to fight a custard monster. You know, it's just, you know, you, you push against it and it just overwhelms you. Um, so I don't want to say that it's all going to get sorted out overnight, but it is absolutely a problem and um, would 100% acknowledge that. Um, what, what was the second part of that again? I forget, sorry. We all need uh, universal basic income to take away the stigma. Yes, there have been some trials around that around the world, and um, I don't think any government has yet committed to that, but um, it is certainly something I personally am very interested in and, and would like to see that. So, for those of you who don't understand, a, a universal um, income would basically replace basic benefits of, about uh, unemployment benefits, but it would also replace tax-free allowance for people that work, so that everybody that is a citizen of the country would get a certain payment, and you wouldn't have, there would be no criteria other than you are a citizen of that country, um, adult over the age of eighteen, so that. It meant that if you work, <coughs> it would uh, you would pay actually every penny that you earn on tax, but you would get that as the equivalent of the tax free that we that we get at the moment. But then people who become unemployed or ill on on, on that had basic benefits wouldn't have to apply because they would already be receiving that basic universal income. Um, I know there was a trial in Fife, actually, um, but uh, I kind of lost track of it, so I don't know anything. And that some of the Scandinavian countries have been trialling it as well. But I think it's something for the future. Hopefully, it, it becomes more prevalent. But I think there needs to be quite a wide-scale study for to see if it works or not. But personally, I, I'm all for that. And, uh, have Carl witnessed an increase in sequestered and applications across the and then a couple of folks asked, what was sequestration? So, right, <clears throat> yeah. So sequestration is just the, the Scottish legal terminology for bankruptcy. So it just, it's just a fancy word for bankruptcy. Um, and in actual fact, over the COVID years, um, we have probably seen a reduction in bankruptcy sequestrations in Perth and Kinross over that time period. But that is because of, so I would say the figures at the moment are very artificial because most of the things that drive people to the debt team, especially at the Bureau, are urgent things like um, court action for being evicted due to rent arrears, mortgage arrears, court actions for debts, um, recovery of cars, things like that. And especially over the first six to nine months of the COVID pandemic, all of those sort of driving factors didn't exist because the courts were shut for everything other than very serious criminal and civil um, protection matters. So you couldn't actually be taken to court for any of those things for such a period of time. And there's such a backlog in the court systems that we're only really now, <clears throat> excuse me, frog in the throat, 24 months later, starting to see those things pick up again. And because those are usually the driving factors, the more serious things that drive more people to bankruptcy or sequestration. Um, so the figures for the last two years are much lower than normal, but it's very artificial due to the pandemic. I do suspect it to go up though. Okay. So just say a massive thanks to Carl today for spending your time with us, um, some really good comments and feedback at the first half session where you have provided feedback and it is really to your own circumstances, we will make sure and help it gets back to you. Some improvement actions as well regarding the multi-story in terms of uh, feedback and making sure we're keeping tenants and residents updated, particularly with the lift issue. Um, so yeah, some really good feedback. But really good discussion points there and quite a lot of information in the chat. So huge thank you. So we'll take all the feedback that we've received today um, and we'll be back in touch. And as you said, we've got sandwiches and cakes in the back. So please have a feast before you go. And thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.